Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 13, which is single case evaluation designs. So single case designs often go by different names. Sometimes people refer to them as single case designs or single subject designs. Sometimes people might refer to them as a single system design, but really it's the idea that we are looking at one thing, one person or one subject or one system. So we have a sample size of N equals one. And what we're looking for is instead of having a controller or comparison group, what we do is we use a baseline and that's considered the control phase. That is what it looks like when an individual has not received the treatment at all. They just come in with either their symptoms or the diagnosis. Then we are going to administer an intervention or a process and we are going to methodically measure it. So this isn't randomly scribbling in my notebook every time I see a client, oh, they look like an eight today. It's a really methodical process that involves a thoughtful approach to data collection and data analysis, but it's great. And when done well, a single case design or a single subject design can have very strong internal validity. In fact, Ruben and Babby refer to it as the most rigorous way that practitioners can implement the final stage of the evidence-based practice process. Now, one of the challenges is there's always going to be limitations. One is that it can be very time consuming to implement. I know when I was a therapist in private practice, I often had clients kind of back to back and I was trying to return phone calls and do documentation. And so there were times where the idea of like giving a survey and having a client fill it out and then tracking data just felt really overwhelming to me. And so it can be time consuming. It also can be a little challenging with data collection and tracking. I did have a consultation with a large system and they were tracking all of the outcomes, really good work. They were consistently collecting data, getting those forms. And I said, oh, great. Have you tracked it? Have you looked at individuals' progress? And they said, no, they're dusty sitting somewhere in a file folder because no one has time to actually implement them and put them in the system. And so data collection, making sure you have someone consistently administering a outcome survey or consistently measuring something, and then someone to collect it and input it in a way that's meaningful, that can also be a challenge. We also run the risk of sometimes clients might have resentment. I'm thinking of a family member who went to go see a therapist and this therapist was trying to do a more traditional single subject design where he was administering a outcomes measurement tool every time my family member went to go see this counselor. Honestly, by the fifth session, she was kind of over it. She's like, I'm sick of filling out this thing. It takes time. I would like to just focus on counseling. So you do have the risk of client resentment or just retention. And sometimes, and we'll talk about how to address this, but one of the challenges, there are times where you cannot delay the intervention. There are times where you can't say, I'm going to spend a week getting a baseline measurement. You have a client that comes in, like when I was working in the psychiatric hospital, maybe you work in emergency department. You're not going to be like, hey, let's wait and get a baseline on you. You have to start the intervention now. So we'll talk about that. There's some alternatives for it, but there's definitely some limitations. Now, the good thing is it can still be very valid. It's a great tool to use. It really can provide a lot of good information for you. It really helps us understand the relationship between the clients we treat and the evidence-based interventions that we use. So similar to other things, even though we're only doing this with a sample size of one, one person or one system, we still have to conceptualize the issue. We have to say, what is the problem? We have to conceptualize what is the target issue or behavior. We have to operationalize. How are we gonna measure it? Are we gonna measure this based on the number of times they report feeling hopeless in the past week. So even though it's one person and that may seem quote easier, we still have to be very intentional about how we conceptualize the behavior that we want to address, how we conceptualize the intervention we're going to use and how do we operationalize it. So here's an example. You might say, I'm looking at a client and I wanna notice participation in the CBT based intervention reduced depression. Maybe I went to a training or I got this really cool intervention. It's a cognitive behavioral therapy based intervention. I want to know, hey, is it actually going to work? Well, reduce depression. What does that look like? We've talked about through other chapters, depression can be really hard to define because it's very complicated and multifaceted. And there's different ways that we can operationalize and measure things. We can look and see if an intervention reduces frequency of a behavior. So how many times a day or how many times a week? We can see if it reduces duration. So maybe you're wanting to see, not necessarily does it reduce periods of major depressive episodes, but are they short? Order, or the magnitude. Maybe you're saying, look, this individual is coming in and they are reporting pretty significant mood swings. I don't know if the intervention is going to reduce the mood swings, but man, they're reporting like a four on the top and a five on the bottom. Let's see if we can get that down to a two in the magnitude. So there's a lot of different ways we have to decide. Do we want to measure frequency, duration, or magnitude? So the first step with the single subject design is setting a baseline. Obviously, it's talking with the client, but when we get into the actual study design, we have to set a baseline.
baseline. And this is often referred to as the A, capital A phase. And that is the idea that we can have five to 10 measurements is kind of the ideal, where you have five to 10 different points where you've measured someone's whatever target behavior you're wanting to look at. Number of times a kid has been suspended, number of outbursts a child has, the severity of depression episodes in the previous month. So we're gonna do five to 10 measures ideally. You can get the data you need three to five measures, and that sometimes is more feasible because to take five to 10 measures, that could make a client weeks to be able to get their intervention started. We don't wanna always do that. So three to five is a good minimum. Safety is always first. And so sometimes if we're not able to do a baseline, if we really need to jump in and start with this process now, we can use what's called a retrospective baseline. So that might be where you tell a client, hey, you're in the hospital now, we're gonna start this intervention, but I would love for you to tell me, can you estimate over the past two weeks, how many days did you have a period of crying that lasted 10 minutes or more? The challenge is clients may not remember all of that. They may say more or they may wanna make themselves look better and say, oh, I haven't been crying at all, even though you know that's not necessarily the case either. But you can at least have people create kind of a retrospective baseline. Once we've got this baseline, what we do is we're going to chart it. There are different types of baselines. There's increasing, decreasing, flat, cyclical, unstable, and retrospective. So we're gonna talk about what those might look like. So let's say I want to talk to Janie about her symptoms of depression. And let's say her target behavior is she just wants to stop crying all the time. So she says, I would like to not be crying every single day. So what you might do is you might create a baseline and you say, okay, well, on day one, how many times were you crying? On day two, how many times or how many minutes? And you're gonna track that maybe for a week. So this is an example of like a decreasing baseline. And sometimes what you'll find is even without the intervention being implemented, people will still report changes in their baseline. Like I've mentioned, sometimes just saying I need help is enough for people to start feeling a little bit better. So with this one, you might have a decreasing baseline. You might have a baseline that's unstable where they're reporting a different amount of the issue. You might have a kid who does really good on day one. On day two, he gets in two fights. On day three, he gets in zero fights. On day four, he gets in seven fights. So sometimes people's baseline is pretty unstable and that's super normal as well. Or you might get one that's just flat. Maybe individuals come in and they're like, look, I've been dealing with the same issue every day for the last six months. So different types of baselines. So once we've gotten our A phase done and charted, then we can do what's called an AB or a basic single case design. This typically has one baseline phase A and the intervention phase B. So for example, let's say we're looking at Cameron's behaviors. He's an elementary school age child. We're looking at the number of times sent to the office per week. So maybe for the first few weeks, we just monitor him. We don't implement an intervention. Maybe we look through his records to do a past or retrospective baseline, or we just monitor him for a little while to see if things change. Maybe you can say on week one, he went four times. Week two, he went three times. Week three, he went four times. So we kind of get this idea of where he's at. And it looks like when he doesn't have an intervention, Cameron is going to the office between three to five times per week for the first seven weeks or eight weeks. Then what we do is we say, okay, what's the intervention? We believe that maybe his acting out has to do with social issues. He's really struggling with social skills. So we think, hey, we're going to put him in a social skills group through the school. So now we're still going to measure him, but he's going to participate in this group. So let's say he's going twice a week. What you can see is that as he's in the skills group for longer, we see a decrease. It looks like approximately towards the end, he's only going to the office one to two times per week. Now the administrator might say that's still too many times, but you can see that's still a decrease compared to where they were. So this is a simple AB design. It's what do people look like before the intervention and what do they look like with the intervention? It may not still fully explain the issue. There could be other things at play here, but it can at least indicate a relationship between the intervention and behavior changes. Now, one of the limits of an AB design is there could be an external thing that happens. Let's say in week eight, Cameron makes a really, really good friend. His friend also struggles a little bit socially, but their buddies eat lunch together and may not even be participation in the skills group. It could be just having someone to eat lunch with and that makes all the difference at that age. So maybe it's not our intervention, but something extraneous. And so that is a little bit of the challenge. It's hard to argue causal inference because we don't know. It could be something else.
We also have what's called the ABAB design, which is also known as the withdrawal reversal design. And this is the idea that you start with the baseline, that A phase. Then you implement the intervention. So let's say with Cameron, we say, no, okay, we monitor him for five weeks. Then we put him in a participation skills group. You notice he goes to the office a little bit after the intervention starts. And just from my personal experience, that's not uncommon. When kids feel overwhelmed, they don't know how to handle the new intervention. Maybe he feels embarrassed. He might act out a little bit more. In the next five weeks, we start to see a slight decrease. So with an ABAB, then what you do is you withdraw the intervention. So now we're going to take the intervention. He does five weeks in the skills group, and then we say, okay, he's going to hang out in the classroom for five weeks, no more skills group. Well, you can see his behavior starts to increase a bit, and then we say, nope, we're going to put him for the last five weeks back in that skills group, and you can see it start to go down. And so it's really nice because you can show like, hey, without this intervention, my client doesn't do as well, which starts to increase that plausibility that maybe intervention has an effect. One thing that's hard with this is a lot of clinicians feel weird with drawing an intervention, especially if we can see that it's starting to work. So Ruben and Babby suggest using something like a natural break, like a school break, or if you start to see that this kid is really struggling, jumping right back in to implement an intervention again, because we don't want Cameron to go back to being in the office all the time. So ABAB is a stronger case that our intervention is working. Another technique that you can use is you can use multiple baseline designs. And so what this is, is we're saying, okay, we're going to do an AB design. Number of times sent to the office, no intervention for the first eight weeks. Then we're going to put him in this skills group and see if he has a change. This still doesn't really tell us a ton, but what if there's Andrew? And what if Andrew is at the same school, maybe a different grade or a different class, but he is also experiencing a similar issue. A lot of fights, a lot of trouble because of social issues. We monitor Andrew for 10 weeks. So Cameron is the first eight weeks and then we put him in the skills group. We start Andrew at the same time, but we're going to monitor him for 10 weeks. Then we're going to put him in the skills group. So it kind of allows us to say, hmm, maybe it's not that eight weeks, everybody suddenly starts feeling better. Maybe it was the actual intervention because Andrew doesn't start showing an improvement until he goes in the skills group at 10 weeks. And so doing multiple baseline designs, administering interventions at different points in someone's treatment or in the process, again, can provide really good information. We also have a multiple component design, and I've seen this a lot in jobs that I've worked. And so this is represented by A, B1, B2, or B3, it can keep going. So A, we start with our no intervention. Let's say Jeannie's coming in, we're administering the PHQ-9, and we're really monitoring her PHQ-9 score. We want to see if there's an improvement in her mental health, depression as represented by her score on this tool. So we monitor for three weeks, no intervention. She just comes in, she completes the assessment. We don't necessarily start an intensive treatment, we're just monitoring how she's doing. Then we say, okay, we want to see if an intervention is making a change. Let's start the intervention. So let's say we start with a more mild or less intense version. We do cognitive behavioral therapy and it's just the verbal. We're just talking through things. There's no homework, there's no workbooks. We're just starting with some thoughts, feelings, cognitive distortions, all of that kind of stuff. So then we say, okay, that was a mild intensity. We had her in there for five weeks. You can see her PHQ-9 score dropped some, so that's a good sign. But then we wanna say, okay, what if we go a little bit more structured with her? She's gotten some of the hard part, the nerves about coming to therapy. Let's dive into this more intensive workbook that I have that's also CBT, but it's just a lot more intense. And then I'm still gonna keep measuring. And what you can see is no intervention. She gets some improvement from just talking through CBT, but man, when she has that structure in there, she sees a huge decrease on her PHQ-9. So this is another good way to kind of start low, Sometimes it might be starting with the least restrictive therapy, something very mild, and then saying, okay, this isn't working. Let's increase the intensity, the length of time, the number of classes, whatever that may be, and see if there's an effect. Finally, we also have what are called ABC or ABCD designs. And so this is where we start with our A phase, no intervention, and then we do a B intervention. And sometimes, you know, we just don't see a change. We just don't, for whatever reason, it's not a good fit for the client or they're not responding well to it. So we might say, you know what, I don't think want to do a B anymore. Let's try a different intervention and see if that helps. And sometimes you might even have a D, that third type. So in this example, we see with Cameron, you have your A phase, no intervention. Then we put him in a skills group. We don't really see a ton of improvement. So we say, you know what, maybe the skills group isn't helping. Let's try a new medication. Maybe there's some untreated ADHD and some impulsivity that's the issue. And then we track that and we say, wow, look, he got a new medication and his number of instances going to the office dropped pretty significantly. Now, this is a little bit challenging because it creates a muddy relationship between the interventions. What if he learned just enough skills 
in the skills group that when combined with the medication was able to help them. We can't necessarily say, oh, it was only the medication. We might have to say, ooh, was it the group participation? Was it the medication or is it the combination? And so ABC and ABCD designs are vulnerable to things like carryover effects. That sometimes our clients learn things or grow or change in one intervention and that's enough to carry over into the next one. We also get things like history. Maybe Cameron just is maturing. 14 weeks is a long time in the life of an adolescent or an elementary age student. Maybe just some maturity was happening or you can get some order effects as well. But what they talk about is one of the nice things about this is you could switch it around. Let's say the next student you look at, you do intervention and the parents say, no, we really want to try a medication first. You try that, you see if there's an improvement and then you could do a skills group. The challenge with that medication is always a hard one. I wouldn't necessarily have a kid on meds for a few weeks and pull them and say, well, that's not working. Let's put them into a skills group instead. So a lot of times what I've seen this, especially working with kids with ADHD is parents will first try positive reinforcement and some behavior modification. And then if that is not quite enough, then they'll go to medication. So we're always thinking, yes, you can replicate these in a different order. You could do ACBD, but we still also have to make sure that we're not doing anything that endangers our children or affects them negatively in any way. Finally, like I mentioned at the beginning, we do have this risk that sometimes our people need interventions right away. I worked in a psychiatric hospital for a number of years and we were not going to say, hey, you've been here for five days. Let's just monitor or a baseline. A lot of times clients came in and they needed treatment now. They were there because they were in crisis. They had just been transferred from the emergency department. So we're not going to do a baseline. We didn't, we needed to get in and do the intervention. So with a B or a B plus design, we start the intervention and we're recording how they're doing. In this case, maybe with Janie, we just start CBT. Day one, she came in, that's like her intake day. Day two, we started already and then we measure the score. So that could be a B plus design. With a B design, you start right away. With a B plus design, you typically have at least one point that's a baseline. And we really just want to say, hey, we don't know how they were with the baseline per se, but ma'am, we can see a decrease in her PHQ-9 score. Again, there's some limits here. This is not really explanatory. Maybe just the fact that she's in the hospital was enough for her. Maybe the camaraderie being in a support group is actually doing her more good than the participation in cognitive behavioral therapy with the therapist. So it doesn't always tell us a ton, but it does give us an idea of, hey, it looks like Janie is doing better while she's participating in this intervention. We also have have the BC designs, which are again, where you jump right in, but maybe use two different interventions. So in this case, maybe Janie comes in and on day one, we automatically start cognitive behavioral therapy. She really is struggling. She needs that intervention. So we would do B for let's say seven weeks. Then we're like, you know, She's not really improving as much as we like. She doesn't feel like she's getting what she needs. Let's try a different intervention. Let's put her in a support group and let's see if that makes a difference. And then we can track her score as well. And so you can definitely look at two different interventions. Again, you still run the risk of, is it the intervention or is it at the effect of time? It can be really challenging and it's not always clear. Finally, the book talks about some very complicated designs that aren't commonly used by practitioners. These might be used more by individual researchers, like social work researchers who wanna look really in depth at specific interventions. So there's different designs. The construction design is you would do baseline A, B intervention, baseline A, C intervention, A for baseline, and then I might do B, C at the same time. So I might say we're going to start with the baseline, introduce some talk therapy, baseline, then do medication, then do baseline, then do meds and talk therapy at the same time, and then see what happens. Then the parentheses represent, well, what are we going to pick? Was it effective B, was it C, or was it B, C together? We also have the strip design where we might start with our baseline, then we introduce two interventions at once, then we go back to baseline, then we do one intervention B, baseline, the other intervention C, and then we pick and then interaction design. So these are more complicated and they're still vulnerable to history and carryover effects, but it at least gets us uh, some numbers and data about what is really the effect on the individual with different combinations, so to speak. So when we pop all of our data in, really what we're looking for a couple of things, we're looking for visual patterns, right? All of these graphs that I created hopefully can help you see, oh, there's some visual movement that gives us some information. We also want to look at, is there a statistical probability that changes are related to the intervention or just normal fluctuations? If I am doing the same intervention on 15 people in single subject designs, and I'm getting the same consistent results doing a multiple baselines design, I might be able to say statistically, I think the odds are higher that this is because of the intervention and just not normal fluctuations. And finally, is the amount of change substantial or clinical? So definitely thinking about those concepts. So that is single subject designs. Next time we'll talk about program evaluation and what that looks like. I hope this was helpful.